I'm Jessica Matthews, president of the Carnegie Endowment. It's a great pleasure to be here and to welcome you uh, to this event, which is to mark the launch of a really wonderful new book by Tom Duvall, um, who is a senior associate here at Carnegie and one of the world's foremost experts on the South Caucasus. Um, I'm very proud to say that uh, Tom has produced here uh, what I think is a, is a terrific book and on one of the world's most difficult and complex subjects, and, uh, and its, its, uh, its publication could not be more timely. Uh, as all of you know by your presence here, uh, there are any number of reasons why we ought to be deeply uh, concerned with what happens in Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Um, and yet, with the exception of a few brief periods of uh, the outbreaks of violence, like the Russia-Georgia war in 2008, um, it's the region is pretty much out of sight, out of mind, and far too uh, little attention is paid. Um, and yet, um, uh, this is a crucible of conflict, this area. It is a key region in the relationship between Russia and the West, uh, the location of three of Europe's most intractable conflicts, and a, and a vital energy corridor. Um, and if that isn't um, sufficient reason to be concerned, I don't know. Um, what is. Uh, this book, I think, uh, will shed um, uh, ter terrific new light on, um, on what is an uh, a obviously important and unbelievably complex subject. About a year and a half ago, uh, we decided, precisely because of its importance, uh, to create a position here at Carnegie dedicated to the South Caucasus. Um, we looked, not quite worldwide, but pretty widely, uh, for the best person that we could find um, uh, to fill it. And this was one of those uh, rewarding searches where one name pops up at the top of everybody's list, um, and it turns out that you're able to lure him here. And so this was an enormously satisfying uh, uh, outcome for us to, to be able to bring Tom Duvall uh, on board earlier this year. Um, he hasn't disappointed. Uh, in the Caucasus, an introduction, he's delivered a gem, and uh, it's, it's meticulous re meticulously researched, insightful, beautifully written, um, and I think uh, all of you will find it a terrific uh, a read. Um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure also to welcome Susan Glasser, uh, the uh, distinguished editor of the most insightful, creative, an interesting journal in our area, foreign policy, um, who has, uh, who will, and an expert on this region who will be our moderator today. Susan, it's great to have you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to bore us all with a, a long additional introduction because I think Jessica has, has really summed it up, except to put in my own plug for Tom's book, which, um, you know, in addition to being important and scholarly, really is a terrific read. And having worked for for four years in the region and being based out of Moscow, it's it's the one book I really wish we had had. And I'm only sorry that you didn't get a chance to write it a decade ago. Uh, maybe it would have all given us a lot more insight and understanding before uh, some of these these conflicts erupted. But you know, it's it's just filled with uh, priceless gems and. You know the the real eye of a writer, uh, as well as a, a scholar and an expert, deployed against the region. And um, you know, so all of you who haven't gotten it yet today, you should get it. Uh, I'm allowed to say that he he would be shamefully flacking uh, for the book if he said that. Um, Tom is going to give us a presentation today that really sort of hits on some of the main points. And I want to make sure that we reserve as much time as possible for all of your questions. Um, you know, Tom has a lot of uh, what I think will be somewhat modestly controversial things to say on the subject of how we should think about the caucuses uh, in relation not only to its, its big brother neighbor next door, but also uh, what is or isn't the U.S. interest in the region, uh, where do Iran and Turkey fit in, uh, and you know, a sort of very real plea for considering these three countries uh, in their own right as well, and not merely always and inevitably as pawns in some broader great game, which is the subject of a piece uh, that he has on Foreign Policy's website today. And, and, and I do think that, in particular, a lot of you uh, will be thinking about 
what are the prospects for future conflict between Russia and Georgia? That's the context in which you may be looking at the South Caucasus right now. And I, I think Tom has, has a lot to say, and I'm sure we're going to elaborate on that more. Uh, some of it very counterintuitive, uh, which is to say that Russia perhaps is, is the bear that doesn't always bite in the region. And uh, I know you'll want to talk with him more about that. But we'll let him begin with his uh, presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Um, it's uh, this is the culmination of it's, this is the moment um, you, you work on a book in the privacy of your study, and then suddenly it's not just a, a thing between you and the, the page and the, the keyboard. It exists in the world, and this is the moment that it exists in the world. So it's a very um, exciting moment for me, and I'd like to thank um, all my. Carnegie colleagues, not only for bringing me here, um, thank you, Jessica, for, but for um, making this event possible because the, the book was a pre-Carnegie venture, but I'm, I'm really touched by the way Carnegie has, em, has embraced it. Um, and um, also lots of people um, I've worked with in the Caucasus, um, in Moscow here today, which is, which is good to see. Um, my wife, Georgina, thanks so much. And um, the only person who isn't here is the dedicatee of the book, um, my daughter who has to be in school, unfortunately. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just give you about a half hour presentation, which is my attempt to distill this uh, quite long book into half an hour with some images uh, to help us on, on, on the way. And, and really trying to focus on, I draw out some of the themes, but particularly this theme about how we perceive the Caucasus and perceiving it better. Um, and um, understanding it better and also, and this is very much my theme of the book, understanding it as a single region and not just disconnected parts. Twenty years after the end of the Soviet Union, the South Caucasus, the countries of Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia and associated territories between the Black and Caspian Seas presents us with a sad picture. The map is still torn up by war. Three de facto statelets, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Nagorno-Karabakh, are still in a twilight zone, separate from their Soviet-era parents, Georgia and Azerbaijan, but not sovereign states either. The region's two longest borders between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and between Georgia and Russia, are still wholly or partially shut, while the nominally open borders are still bureaucratic barriers to free trade. Poverty and unemployment are deeply rooted. Hundreds of thousands of refugees are still displaced by war. Millions more work away from home as migrant workers, especially in Russia. Take a look at the world GDP table. Oil-rich Azerbaijan has climbed up, but is still barely half as rich as Russia or Turkey, with Armenia and Georgia even further behind. Their former Soviet co-republic, Estonia, is three times wealthier than Azerbaijan and six times richer than Armenia or Georgia. So I would contend an enormous human potential is being disgracefully squandered here. <clears throat> Both locals and outsiders share the blame for this sad picture. The outsiders are at fault, in part because of failures of perception that have, in my view, only made bad local politics worse. So in this presentation, I want to identify what I call three mirages, three misguided approaches to this region that obscure proper understanding of the way it works. But, so you don't get thoroughly depressed, I also want to cite the surprising case of two multi-ethnic markets as a counterexample of how well things can work in this region. I start from one principle that not everybody shares. The South Caucasus is a region, deserves to be treated as one, and benefits from a holistic regional approach. If you treat this place as a single organism, that increases the health of all its parts. Many don't agree. Some argue that the idea of a South Caucasus, or its Russo-centric variation, the Trans-Caucasus, is just a Russian colonial construction, and it's better nowadays to jettison the concept altogether or include it in a wider Black Sea region, quote, unquote. Others say the, the three main parts of this fractured whole are so distinct from one another that each needs to be addressed separately. Now, of course, no definition should be a straight back, straitjacket, but I want to make the case that there is indeed a South Caucasus region. Begin with the map, and here's the map from space. It shows a geographical space defined by, defined by three strong natural borders, the Black and Caspian Seas and the Great Caucasus mountain range, the highest mountains in Europe, which, in the famous phrase of the Greek geographer Strabo, 
form a rampart to the isthmus which separates one sea from another. This makes for a space that is neither fully Europe, Russia, Asia, nor the Middle East, a bridgehead of three small nations surrounded by much bigger neighbours. And there are three other common features I want to mention. A shared culture that any anthropologist will recognise, of rituals, family traditions, not to mention Caucasian music and food. This has more than just folkloric interest. It helps to dispel the myth of ancient hatreds dividing Caucasians from one another. A, sh a, shared, ha a shared history within the Russian Empire has also left its mark. This has given the people of the region a distinct political culture, both more secular and Europeanized, but also more politically oppressive than its other neighbors. Finally, economic infrastructure makes this a region and a communications corridor. Russian railroad engineers literally blasted this economic region into existence in 1890 when they carved out a rail tunnel through the Sarami highlands of central Georgia. And here's the tunnel. Um, before this tunnel was built in 1890, Georgia was really two separate countries. Um, it was a one which was a western Black Sea one and a central one, um, the western one under Ottoman influence and the central one under Persian influence, the Surami Tunnel suddenly linked it together. So by, doing, by building this tunnel, they properly united western and eastern Georgia for the first time and also laid the well, were, way for the world's first so-called kerosene pipeline linking, linking Baku and the Black Sea coast, the forerunner of today's baku tbilisi Jehan pipeline. A new web of railways was laid in all directions. Now, this shared economic space is vulnerable, as, as was shown in 1905, 1918, 1992, and 2008, to, to cite just four examples. A disruption in Georgia hurts Azerbaijan and Armenia as well. The South Caucasus then can be a dynamic hub, or as it is today, a tangle of checkpoints and closed roads and railways. And unfortunately, the tendency to break down is nothing new. We've been here before. Here's the report of one foreign observer. The three governments from an Occidental standpoint are now thoroughly inefficient, without credit, and undoubtedly corrupt. Alone, each faces inextricable financial difficulties. Religious differences and its racial threaten to embroil them unless brought under a common control. Two of them have no outlet to the Black Sea, except through Georgia over the railroad. They have no present intermonetary, postal, or customs union, and are stated no definite agreement for common control and use of the railroad, and are in, are in continual squabbles over boundaries. Azerbaijan has no educated class capable of well administering, administering a government. Georgia is threatened by Bolshevism. Armenia is in ruins and partial starvation. Well, some echoes there, but the year was actually 1919. The observer was the US General James Harbord, sent to the region by President Woodrow Wilson. Here he is. Um, tough job sent to fix the region from, from Washington. Uh, Wilson, nothing if, if not ambitious. Harvard was witnessing what I call a recurring historical condition, which was more, even more acute in 1918 to 20 than it was in the 1990s. On each occasion, the Tsarist and then the Soviet policemen disappeared, and the locals were left in a state of conflict and chronic insecurity. Harbord drew the, drew the almost utopian conclusion that the region could be adopted under a US mandate. If we, re if we refuse to assume it, he wrote, for no matter what reasons satisfactory to ourselves, we shall be considered by many, many millions of people as having left unfinished the task for which we entered the war and as having betrayed their hopes. Well, this was his ambitious answer, the idea of a mandate, to a historical challenge. How to provide the South Caucasus with both liberty and regional security at the same time. In 1919, as in 1991, it had the first it had liberty without the second regional security. And just talking about repeating patterns, that's Armenians fleeing um, Eastern Anatolia in 1915 um, to their deaths um, in millions of cases. And um, 1993, Azerbaijanis fleeing Kelbajar region during the Armenian-Azerbaijani war over Karabakh. So, some of the same, unfortunately, repetitions, and, and don't forget this is also a region characterized by enormous numbers of displaced people and refugees. So, Harbord's, and here's a, here's a reminder from Harbord 
um, about how history changes as well, that in 1919, there was a big Western super, superpower, which was seen as the dominant military power of the age, and that was Great Britain. And there was a power interested in multilateralism and softer power, and that was the United States. And General Harbord makes the point, the taking of a mandate in this region would, of course, bring the United States into the politics of the old world, contrary to our traditional policy of keeping free of affairs in the Eastern Hemisphere. Well, his description, I think, and the situation he found and was unable to do much about brings me to what I call my first mirage. The illusion that the Caucasus is a quote-unquote great chessboard, where the big powers set their goals and then push the locals around like, pools, like pawns. That is not actually what happens here. It wasn't really true in 1919, and it certainly isn't true today. In actual fact, the weather changes, the geopolitical weather changes, but the locals manipulate the outside powers more than the other way around. The cost is always high, but they always survive. I think the key point is that in the 21st century, the Caucasus is still the Caucasus in all its complexity and variety. It's not an assimilated province of Russia, Turkey, or Iran. You could call it a balance of insecurity. Over the course of history, Armenians, Azerbaijanis, and Georgians, and others, have survived invasion and resisted assimilation. But the price of doing this has come in the form of Faustian alliances with other great powers. Well, General Harbord's, what, what General Harbord saw was a regional, regional rivalry in which to protect themselves, Azerbaijanis allied themselves with Turks and British, Georgians with Germans and British, Armenians, Abkhaz and Ossetians with Russians. By doing so, these small peoples inevitably ended up at war with one another and as proxies in great power conflicts. Now, in 1920-21, Bolshevik Russia, of course, conquered the region, but it didn't so much resolve the contradictions of the Caucasus as smother them bringing an end to conflict through suffocating authoritarian rule. Then, as Soviet power faded in the late Gorbachev period, the pendulum swung again. In a close re replica of the previous period, Abkhaz and Ossetians sought Russian assistance against what they saw to be a Georgian nationalist threat, and then newly independent Georgia looked to new Western allies to pr protect itself against a perceived Russian threat. In Soviet times, a conflict between Georgians and Ossetians would have been unthinkable. The two ethnic groups had the highest levels of intermarriage in Soviet Georgia. But the unhealthy dynamics of the post-Soviet era drove each to seek the protection of different patrons in Washington and Moscow. Eventually, in 2008, South Ossetia turned into the arena of the worst clash between Russia and the United States since the end of the Cold War. And two images of what happened. That's Skinvali after the Georgian bombardment. And this is Gori burning when the Russians bombed the city. So it's better to, to describe this picture not as a giant chessboard, but as a castle of dominoes, where the whole construction totters if you dislodge one piece. If you try and treat re this region as a game of chess, everyone loses. This brings me to Russia and another mirage, that of the Russian bear looming over this region, ready to maul the small Caucasian peoples. This view is persistent, not least because many Russians still share it but I believe it's highly exaggerated. Let me, let me be clear about this. Russia is still the most powerful outside actor in the region, if only by default. In the 1990s, parts of its military meddled disastrously in the conflicts of the region. It now has troops in the town of Akhalgori, 30 miles from Tbilisi. My point is a different one. Russia's capacity to control events here is always smaller than it seems. The peoples of the South Caucasus have, in fact, spent two centuries cultivating the skill of playing off Russia quietly and getting on with their own agenda. Again, geography plays a determining role. Contrast the South with the North Caucasus, where Russia generally tries to rule by consent, but can, if it wants to, resort to the use of overwhelming military power. South of the mountains, Russia's capacities are stretched even further. First of all, the physical barrier of the mountain range presents a formidable obstacle. The main road across the, across the mountains, the Georgian military highway, was completed only in 1817, and still then was, was a, a narrow road, pretty much impassable to artillery, which in a, at a stroke, of course, restricted Russia's military capacities in this region. And also, I think, um, restricted Russian migration to this region, because um, as a part of as in contrast to parts of the other Soviet space, like Kazakhstan or the Baltic states, the number of ethnic Russians in the South Caucasus is actually less than 2%. Um, add to that 
histories of strong statehood in the region, and you've got a, a place where Russia really has to rule hand-in-hand uh, hand with local rulers, and actually has far fewer levers um, than we think. In the 20th century, Bolshevik and Soviet rule of the region was never a fully Russian affair. Of course, ultimate authority lay in Moscow, and Moscow ordered mass repression here, as it did, as it did in the rest of the USSR. But locals ran the show pretty much from the beginning. And here's a little uh, show of some locals. Uh, um, Mikoyan, Stalin, <laughs> and Orjana Kidzi. Good array of moustaches there. Um, three, three men who basically um, conquered the Caucasus for the Bolsheviks, all locals, one Armenian and two Georgians. Uh, that's um, Haydar Aliyev with Brezhnev. It's not quite clear who's more powerful in that picture. If, 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 you didn't, if you didn't know that the man on the left was more powerful, you might think the man in the middle was. Um, uh, um, Aliyev was incredibly skilled at, at playing off Moscow. And there's Shevardnadze and Gorbachev, again, um, another very powerful man. Um, and note that these, the last two, Aliyev and Shevardnadze, were extremely good Soviet operators, fully loyal to the system, but then became basically the two men who then led independent Azerbaijan and Georgia and consolidated the independence of Azerbaijan and Georgia. So again, these local actors are extremely shrewd operators. So Russia has very few levers to pull here. In 2008, many Western analysts saw the August war as evidence of Russia's neo-imperialist plans for domination in the South Caucasus and the near abroad in general. In actual fact, since then, a different trend has been in play. Having lost Georgia, Moscow has spent much of the last two years offering incentives to Azerbaijan and negotiating hard on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Even, I would say, Russia's recent consolidation of a military alliance with Armenia cannot disguise a long-term strategic retreat from this region. The local players, including the Armenians, prefer to have multiple partners and not just one. In other words, Russia is slowly adjusting to living with a neighborhood where it's one of several international players. As such, it's relying more and more on economic tools to retain influence. Um, and um, a point that Sergei Makadonov made recently, a very good one, uh, Russia is actually still heavily invested in Georgia. Um, Georgia is still getting Russian gas. Um, so despite the enmity on a political level, um, there's actually plenty of Russian business still in Georgia. So why, why the misunderstanding? about Russia? Well, partly, of course, historical distrust. distrust. But, but also, I believe, because Abkhazia and South Ossetia are special cases and exceptions to this rule of diminishing Russian control. Both territories border the Russian North Caucasus, and in the 20th, 20th century, both looked to Russia as a counterbalance to the perceived threat of Georgian assimilation. Ordinary Russians have strong associations about Abkhazia as they do about a few places. In fact, the only other place, I would say, is Crimea. Now, have a look at this picture. Um, Abkhazia in the 1970s, if you mention the word Abkhazia, um, that's the beach in Putsunda, um, I think that's what Russians' main association would be. It was their, pretty much their favorite holiday resort. In the book, I actually have a section called Soviet Florida, um, which, which uh, talks about Abkhazia. Both Abkhazia and South Ossetia accepted de facto Russian control in 1992 and 1993 as a de facto price for secession from Georgia. Even here, though, I would say Russia is more vulnerable than it looks. In the cold light of day, Moscow has stored up new problems for itself by recognizing the two countries as independent, the two territories, maybe, I should say, as independent in, 19, in 2008. This recognition policy has stirred up discontent in the North Caucasus. Other states have not followed suit. Russia has bitten off perhaps more than it, it can chew here. So the Russian bear is something of an illusion, a prickly, unpredictable beast, certainly, but not an all-powerful one, and one with whom others can do business in the South Caucasus. I do believe it's now possible, for example, that Russia and the United States to do business over the Karabakh dispute and to come to an agreement on a shared security structure for that dispute. In the long term, I believe a truce is also possible over Abkhazia and South Ossetia. The reason for that is chiefly in two words, North Caucasus. Russia cannot stabilize the northern side of the mountains on its own, but eventually needs the help of Georgians, Abkhaz, Ossetians in the West to do so. A deal over South Ossetia, which was always economically part of Georgia and is linked to Russia by just one tunnel through the mountains, is certainly achievable. Now turning to the West. Western Europe and the United States have properly 
rediscovered the South Caucasus only in the past 20 years, sometimes with great enthusiasm. This enthusiasm, though, has its downside. My third mirage is the perception of the South Caucasus as an area of great Western strategic interest. Paradoxically, I believe, this kind of talk can actually do more harm than good. Again, I want to be properly understood here. In energy terms, the South Caucasus is indeed an important transport corridor for Caspian Sea oil and gas. Oil pump through the BTC pipeline has also brought billions of dollars of much needed revenue to Azerbaijan and rather less to Georgia. Caspian Sea gas has lessened the reliance of both countries on Russian gas. My concerns are twofold. First, energy policy was not really part of an eco integrated economic strategy. Resource extraction tends to benefit elites and foreign companies more than it does ordinary people. Certainly, it creates very few jobs, and less than 2% of the Azerbaijani workforce, workforce is employed directly in the oil and gas industry. Without a broader economic upturn, energy wealth has the capacity to aggravate social, social divisions rather than ease them. Here's a picture of modern-day Baku, which you would, could say is a success story, a kind of new Dubai on the Caspian, but also if you look at the rest of Azerbaijan, much of it is still living in great poverty. Secondly, too many Western policy makers treated pipeline policy as a big strategic game. In the 1990s, several new Caspian enthusiasts allowed themselves to believe in extravagant claims about the oil resources of the Caspian Sea, comparing them to those of Kuwait or Saudi Arabia. These claims later turned out to be highly exaggerated. A pair of unhelpful metaphors made things worse by winding back history. The image of a new Silk Road stretching from Central Asia is a pretty one, but it conjures up a medieval era of pre-modern principalities before Russia was involved in the region. And the idea of a great game, next slide, comparing the new interest in the South Caucasus with the struggle for influence between Tsarist Russia and Great Britain in the 19th century cast the locals as passive objects, not subjects, and Moscow in the role of a deadly rival. And this is a famous cartoon from Punch magazine, and the caption underneath it actually said, this emir says, save me from my friends. <laughs> in retrospect, grand strategic ambitions for the region ran ahead of a more sober assessment of its place on the European energy map and its economic needs. The second grand strategic vision imposed on the Caucasus was that of NATO expansion into Georgia. The issue is not, I would stress, Georgia's right to join NATO, the, and I do, do, do acknowledge that the Georgian public voted for this by a good majority in a referendum. The issue is whether active pursuit of this was a good policy for either Georgia or NATO, and I believe it's now clear it was not. The plan did not improve Georgia's security. The island alliance was not ready for a country with undeveloped armed forces and weak state institutions, as well as, crucially, two unresolved conflicts on its territory in which Russia had a declared interest. In 2008, the Russian leadership said the move was a threat, and the Abkhaz and South Ossetias turned even closer to Russia to be their protector, widening the conflict divide. In mid-August, when the conflict with Russia had played itself out, Georgia was left with neither Abkhazia and South Ossetia, nor a membership action plan for NATO. Far better, in my view, than this kind of rhetorical and selective strategic engagement would have been more focused, lower-level investment in institution building from below. That would at least allow the locals to make sober assessments of their own capacities for what they themselves should ask from which Western patrons with limited attention spans. This leads me to the paradoxical conclusion that a healthy dose of strategic insignificance would be no bad thing for the South Caucasus. It would allow all interested parties to concentrate on helping solve its everyday problems. The many problems of the South Caucasus are linked, I would contend, and cannot be solved in isolation. A rethink of policy towards this region should begin with Dwight Eisenhower's recommendation, if you can't solve a problem, enlarge it. To calm its security problems, the South Caucasus would be well served by some kind of truce between the latter-day great powers, in which they accept the interests of the others so long as their intentions are not hostile. That covers Turkey. Sooner or later, it must include Iran, which has an ancient historic interest in the region. Chiefly, it concerns Russia and the West. The outsiders should agree not to provide offensive weapons to the region and to work together to halt any slide to conflict. That vision only makes sense if the region belongs to no regional security organization. It's in between status, making, making it a zone of neutrality rather than conflict. At the moment, clearly, this vision is utopian. Um, given the heavy Russian presence in Abkhazia and South Ossetia and the smoldering volcano of the Karabakh dispute. Still, outsiders have greater freedom to imagine a different future than locals do, 
and can frame their policies with that destination in mind. Hand in hand with a vision for greater security goes an economic vision, which only makes sense as a regional project, with the South Caucasus region imagined as a free trade zone and communications hub radiating out to five points of a star, to Russia, the Caspian Sea, Iran, Turkey, and the Black Sea. The day the railway line is reopened through Russia, Abkhazia, Georgia, Armenia, Nahichivan to Iran, is the day the South Caucasus regains its role as a region with real prospects for the future. But currently, I'm afraid, the situation looks like this. That's an abandoned railway carriage in Abkhazia, um, the Abkhaz railway, a railway going nowhere. Few locals and outsiders think in these terms. Narrow bilateralism is an abiding problem in Caucasus policy and is made worse by multiple policy agendas of a country such as Russia or the United States. With some honorable exceptions, uh, many of them in this room, I'm afraid that in Washington nowadays, there is less often, less often a South Caucasus policy than three bilateral policies, each with its own adherents. I don't need to tell you where these adherents are. Um, the Armenian lobby over in Congress, mainly Azerbaijan, um, mainly in the oil industry, and Georgia as a prize exhibit in, still for some people, in President Bush's democratization agenda. Bilateralism re reinforces divisions. Many members of Caucasian governing elites are opposed to regional cooperation, which reduces their own power and cuts the profits of monopolies run by their friends and allies. They also prefer to keep the population as economic clients, not independent actors. Even the most reformist government in the region, that of Mikhail Saakashvili in Georgia, rules from the center by fiat, moving from one favored project to the next. Saakashvili is said to have even to have chosen himself the color of the new buildings in his mass redevelopment of the port city of Batumi. The most promising agents of change in the Caucasus are to my mind currently some of the most marginal, small businessmen and traders. There is huge entrepreneurial energy here, but sadly, sadly, too much of it is outside the region, being invested in places like Russia, not in the Caucasus itself. One day, however, these people could follow the trail blazed by the business, small businessmen of Anatolia, who have spearheaded Turkey's dynamic economic growth over the past decade. Small traders are no respecters of borders or ethnic difference, and the mythical ancient hatreds that politicians sometimes conjure up to mobilize loyalty and hatred. International organizations have spent millions over the past two decades on peace-building projects in the South Caucasus. But the two most effective catalysts for cross-border cooperation were two markets that were entirely spontaneous. One was outside the village of Agneti, on the administrative border between South Ossetia and Georgia. It was so large that buyers would drive up and down it on motorcycles. Georgians and Ossetians traded almost everything there, there from cars to matches and the profits of the market sustained South Ossetia for a decade. The second market was in the village of Sadakhlo inside Georgia. And there, the two groups trading there were Armenians and Azerbaijanis, um, um, almost no Georgians in sight. Those are actually some Armenian traders um, selling their uh, mandarinchiki, as they call them in Russian, to Armenians. Georgian and Armenian politicians closed down both these markets in the earlier part of the last decade, saying they were a massive source of tax-free trade. Well, they were, um, and technically speaking, both of these markets were havens of smuggling. But it would have been far better to keep them open and work to legalize their operations and channel them in a better direction. As it happened, the closure of Egneti in 2004 reoriented the South Ossetian economy, economy away from Georgia towards Russia, setting, it, setting South Ossetia on a path of division and conflict. The closure of Sadakh law shut down a place that had vaccinated thousands of Armenians and Azerbaijanis against the virus of ethnic hatred. Despite its exterior of nationalist unanimity, the lesson of these two markets is that under the surface, the Caucasus is still a place of dynamic individuals. So if the great, great game strategists want to make a po positive difference here, my recommendation to them is that they consider retraining as small business consultants. As for Western policymakers, I believe they should ask themselves two questions every, every time they decide to intervene in the South Caucasus. Is my action helping to open borders and free up a blocked region? And does it empower ordinary people and not just governments? There is enough local talent here. It's just a matter of mobilizing it to break down barriers and not entrench them. Thank you.
Thanks so much. That was absolutely a sort of terrific tour <laughs> of the horizon. I think I'd, I'd love to pick up with your, your notion of strategic insignificance. <laughs> I think it's the first time I've seen a regional expert uh, make the case in Washington uh, for why Washington should not really pay quite so much attention. Uh, a different kind of region. attention. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I wonder if you can sketch out a little bit more for us uh, on this notion of strategic insignificance and how it might or might not affect the prospects for resolving uh, these conflicts that have been festering in the region for so long. You, you also talk about you know, an arc of instability, really, that has is, that is hung over the region for, for decades. And I wonder, when you look at the really unresolved nature of the standoff in Ossetia, when you look at Abkhazia, when you look at Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, and whether they all stand the prospect of remaining as these, these frozen conflicts, mm -hmm. uh, how would Russia and the United States pulling back, in a way, from the region uh, improve the prospects for peace? That seems a very counterintuitive notion. Well, I suppose my starting point as someone who's, who's spent so much time in this region is, is, and deliberately identifying those markets is that um, if there's some kind of truce, whatever you want to call it, security architecture, stab stability in, t in terms of the security situation, um, these people get along absolutely fine. Um, it's when, that there's when there's some kind of breakdown in the security arrangement um, then the divisions uh, happen. But um, the Agneti market, um, Georgians and Ossetians were trading there every day. Um, a lot of intermarriage there, as I mentioned before. So it's, um, if, if we can find some way of looking at bottom up, a truce at the top um, between um, sort of call off the great game, as, as, as your editor um, very elegantly called my piece in, in foreign policy, call off the great game, a truce at the top, and then um, you find that actually on the ground, um, people, you know, their, their self-interest is, is mainly economic. They want to trade with none, one another. They, they don't want conflict. So it, it's about fixing, um, drawing back from the antagonism which has traditionally plagued this region um, and, and looking at some more bottom-down and regional engagement, I suppose that's my thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's one of the real powerful aspects of the book is your ability to marry sort of the ground truth and your, your reporter's eye, really, with uh, that of your scholarly and the historical background. You were just, you were just in the region uh, a couple times earlier this year and, and went to Nagorno-Karabakh. How does it look from there? What are we missing from here when we think about, you know, we talk about terms like frozen conflict, we talk about, you know, the Minsk group and that sort of thing. What, what does it look on the ground after literally, you know, more than a decade of, of legal limbo? It, it looks bad, um, and that's what my gloomy introduction was about that. Um, and actually, I, I, I have a personal mission to try and ban the use of the word frozen conflicts. Um, okay. I, I, um, I think people called South Ossetia a frozen conflict and then right. it, it was hot. Uh, it actually unthought. I, I prefer the pr phrase smoldering conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I'm afraid Karabakh is, is very much a smoldering conflict. Um, um, there are bad shooting incidents on the ceasefire line there between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. And, and also feeling when you go to Karabakh, which is now 100% Armenian, that they are closer psychologically to to Glendale in California than they are to the Azerbaijani villages on the, on the other side of the line. So something has gone badly wrong that the, these divisions, uh, people who actually um, have many ways of getting on, ha have been drawn on, on, drawn on the map. And, and I think Karabakh, and particularly that ceasefire line, is something we should be watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was really struck by that in your introduction today, that you, know, you sketched out really a, a sort of post-Soviet history for this region that has been one of greater division and, and you know, a land of checkpoints and uh, railroads that, that don't go where they're meant to go, uh, rather than uh, you know, sort of resurgence of you know, viable nation states and that sort of thing. Um, what are some of the surprises when you think about your own beginnings of your engagement with the region uh, and then looking at what's happened over the last couple of decades. You know, what are two or three things that, that stick with you the most that you know, when you first encountered Georgia, when you saw the Soviet Florida uh, versus today, you probably didn't imagine uh, you know, fighting uh, you know, at, the, at the bikini zone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean this, this is the scary thing. I've, I've now been, um, as a Caucasus reporter, I've now been to I guess three places um, before war happened. Chechnya was the first, Abkhazia, second, South Ossetia, 
the third, um, where you see it before war happens, and then and then, and then the place gets um, overtaken by war, and you realise that this, um, the fragility of the place, and also, and I very much um, not a determinist here that these conflicts didn't need need to happen, that they could have been handled differently, and that's what's so depressing. Um, and the other thing that I, 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 I constantly observe in this region is, is, the, is that people have a kind of twin, twin track. Um, the same person you talk to, and they're very aggressive about some other ethnic group. Um, and then they relax a bit. You've been talking for an hour. They, they, they relax in your company. And suddenly, the completely opposite narrative appears. My favorite example of this was the Azerbaijani general who I interviewed, um, who was just, you know, there was almost blood foaming at his mouth as he talked about the Armenians, about how we're going to drive them out of um, Karabakh, and we're going to drive them out of Zangazur, which is part of Armenia. And then we, we had a chat, and then, and, then, and then he sort of said, oh, you're off to Yerevan. Are you? Well, you must um, give my greetings to my old friend. He's, I think he's now chief of the general staff. We, we're in staff call. And suddenly, you know, the other side of the same personality emerges. And, and, and so it's, it's, a, it's about, I suppose, engaging with these people is... Well, clearly, you've got to engage with their rhetoric, but you've also got to seek out the, the other person who's hidden in there somewhere as well. Mm -hmm. That's an important point. Now, it's sort of outside of the scope of the book, but I, I wonder what your, your sort of quick comparison is between uh, the conflicts of the South Caucasus and what's happened over the last decade in, in the North Caucasus. Right. Um, you know, you read every day of uh, new incidents, uh, not only in Chechnya, but really s increasingly outside of it in Dagestan and the, and the like. Uh, do, you, do you think that there's uh, any commonality uh, to these conflicts at this point, or are they really having a very different and, and very Russian narrative in the North Caucasus? Um, I, I, I should make that, well, I think it will have to be a standard apology in these presentations, that, although the book is called The Caucasus. It's actually about the South Caucasus. I, I did discuss this with my publisher, but they were very clear. They said the South Caucasus and introduction won't sell us so many copies. <laughs> so, um, um, so I have written about the North Caucasus. <laughs> you can find my book on Chechnya if you want that. Um, but, um, um, but certainly, I do. I do believe these are, these are quite different worlds. Um, they intersect. They intersect in Abkhazia and in Ossetia and a bit in Dagestan. But they are different worlds. Um, the North Caucasus has no real tradition of independent statehood. Um, much more Islamic, um, less modern, um, and um, the, clearly uh, an area of Russian strategic interest in the way the South Caucasus simply simply isn't. And I think what we're seeing at the moment is a divergent narrative. I think there always has been actually a divergent narrative. Um, the, the same Russian governor, Vorontsov, who was fighting the Chechens and exterminating them, was actually, um, you know having dinner with the Georgian nobility every night and restoring their rights. So those are, there's definitely two different narratives um, there. Um, and um, I, th I, th I, th I think um, the North, this is one reason why I say it's actually possible to engage with Russians on the South Caucasus, because they need some help in the North Caucasus. I think they've lost the North Caucasus. They don't really know what to do. They've tried policies, some of which have been pretty much, um, um, uh, you know, genocidal, for want of a better word. Um, they're now drawing back from that. Um, but clearly, the hearts and minds of the people of the North Caucasus have gone in a different direction. And it's all about stabilizing it. And, and it really needs some kind of economic stabilization is, is the only way to do that. But they don't really have the tools to do that. Um, so I think there's very different things going on. There. Mm -hmm. Aside from what's happening right now in the North Caucasus, you mentioned Nagorno-Karabakh. Is that? A the potential flashpoint of your greatest concern right now in the region? Uh, you look at Abhazia, you look at Ossetia, do you see the real prospects of uh, the smoldering flames uh, reigniting anytime soon there? Well, Abhazia and South Ossetia, I mean, um, are off the agenda for the time being. The Russians have just, you know, blanketed the, the region in, in troops. I think, as I said, there's actually more prospects for long-term agreement than um, we can perceive now. Karabakh is much more worrying. We, we've got a resurgent Azerbaijans, um, um, much richer each year from oil revenues, spending literally billions each year on, on the military. We have a, a ceasefire line which runs for more than 100 miles with trenches. It's a bit like the, the First World War. Hmm. Sometimes the trenches just 40 yards apart. Armenian and Azerbaijani soldiers on either side um, sniping at one another. And basically the only reason that ceasefire holds is, is a kind of... Um, consensus that it would be a bad thing to start a war. But you know, 
that consensus could change, and, and we have to be to be worried about that. Mm -hmm. Are there any upcoming political moments of uh, you know where there could be a uh, what's the right word a fork in the road that could that could lead to new round of conflict there? Um, nothing in immediate prospect. I think there's just a long term trend which which is worrying. Um, the the talks have pretty much um, stalled. Um, Armenia was distracted by the. Uh, normalization process with Turkey, which then in itself stalled, and that in itself then hurt the Armenia Azerbaijan process. The Azerbaijan is a frustrated, they see no progress, they get more belligerent, the Armenians retrench. We get into an, a negative cycle. So, since you have joined us in Washington, uh, it, I'm, I'm really curious to get a sense from you of what your you know, what are the most common misconceptions here, uh, you know, about. The region, uh, you know, I'm sure you must get questions all the time about Georgia, about Saakashvili, about why the conflict started. But, but what are two or three things that, that leap out to you that the Washington policy world doesn't doesn't really understand about this place? Well, I think one is certainly still seeing it through the prism uh, of Russia, which is a bit paradoxical um, that you're actually kind of ma magnifying the role of Russia by being hostile to it. Um, so there's a bit of a paradox here. Some of the people who say they're they're, they're kind of worried about Russia actually giving Russia more importance than perhaps it deserves in the region. Um, I think Washington, I think, still has a lot of people who um, still think about Russia perhaps too much and in, in, in too negative terms. I mean, I, I certainly have my problems with Russia, I think, it's, and I've certainly seen some terrible things it's done, but I think we're not focused enough on Russia's limitations, Russia's weaknesses, Russians, Russia's reasons to cooperate. And secondly, uh, the, the other thing that has struck me is this bilateralism. Um, Jim Collins, who unfortunately isn't here, um, allows me to use a phrase, a good phrase he, co he copyrighted, terminal bilateralism, which I, I think is a problem in Washington and particularly a problem in, in the Caucasus. I meet people here who are very good, who, but very thoughtful, but they only know one bit of the Caucasus. They know Armenia, they know Azerbaijan, they know Georgia, um, and they don't see how the three are interconnected, and they don't see how just focusing on one bit um, and not the others um, it can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a great point to uh, let our audience jump in today. This is this is such a knowledgeable group. I want to have questions. If you could just, when you raise your hand, just identify yourself and what organization you're with. I think that would be great. Right here in the front. This is John Evans, um, formerly State Department. Uh, first of all, I, I just want to congratulate Carnegie for having brought you here, Tom. I th uh, we really felt the lack of, of good expertise on the Caucasus, and uh, you are beginning to, to uh, fill that gap for most admirably, and, and uh, congratulations on your book. There are two points you made that I, I see as potentially in conflict. First of all, you very helpfully pointed out, and, and those of us who've worked there know that very often the, these little countries manipulate the big ones uh, to their advantage, and they have uh, centuries of uh, experience in doing this. Now, how do you, you then also talked about strategic insignificance and suggested that the area ought to be off limits for great gaming um, and uh, left to, to, not to its own devices, but uh, as a neutral place. But the trouble is that these two things work against each other. These parties, these small parties, are constantly trying to draw in uh, the bigger powers. Now, Iran so far, not so much, although you, I'm glad that, uh, that you mentioned Iran, both of you, because uh, so often we forget, uh, with our focus on the nuclear issue, we forget that Iran is an important potential regional power. But don't you think that these, that we really need to that we, the bigger powers, the outside, need to be trying to maintain the balance there in, in, a, in a more traditional um, political military sense, trying to avoid situations that would uh, lead to instability. That's my question. Mm. Well, I hope I didn't give the impression by that um, when I said strategic insignificance that I meant sort of neglect. Um, that, and, and, and I did have the concept in that, in that presentation about a truce, um, um, which could, and, and indeed, Russia and the United States are working quite closely together on the Minsk group, on Karabakh, and in, in my view, should actually be having the conversation now about what kind of security arrangement could be, impo could be introduced there, 
uh, post-conflict. Um, so um, certainly I didn't want to give the impression um, that I'm talking about a kind of withdrawal. I'm just talking about a kind of reconceptualizing of the region in which um, you, you talk less about competition over the Caucasus and you talk more about cooperation and you also focus more on a kind of economic, integrated economic model um, um, for the region. Um, you know, the region as a communications corridor, which seems to me it has to be its potential and it's and a potential which is obviously completely broken at the moment. Yeah, in, in the back there. Toby Davis, U.S. Department of State. Thank you very much for an excellent, excellent book. Um, could you please elaborate on the reasons why Russia might want to cooperate with the U.S. and all the regional powers to come up with um, the security architecture or um, way of handling the region, all the players in the area? Thanks. Um. Well, I think there, there's definitely multiple Russias. There's a Russia which um, def definitely does have sort of neo-colonialist dreams of, of the Caucasus. I think that Russia was, was stronger in the 90s than it is now. Um, and I think there's still a divide within Moscow about um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, I think we pretty much know now that the foreign ministry was, it was against it. Um, and um, is Sam... Sam Sharap here. Sam, Sam could could tell us, but um, but it, he can correct me if I'm wrong. But he actually talked when at the Veldai Club, um, Putin was actually making comments about Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which were much softer in tone than previously, saying that a deal can be done in the future. Um, all of which leads me to say that that there are certain NATO expansion is a is a Russian red line, um, whether we like it or not, and and fortunately. <laughs> In my view, fortunately, NATO expansion is now off the agenda. So if we are looking at a more uh, neutral Caucasus, um, uh, more demilitarized Caucasus um, in, in the long term, um, then I think there is prospect for, for cooperation. Um, and again, I come back to the issue of the North Caucasus, that actually um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, both border, and Dagestan, um, and Azerbaijan bordering Dagestan, um, all border the North Caucasus, and, and Russia, at some point, is going to need some more help in stabilizing that that, that region um, and getting economic investment into that region. All of which leads me to think that there are good reasons we can work with the, the better half of Russia um, on, on this region. Oh, sorry. I'll get you next. Sorry. Uh, Jeff Goldstein from the Open Society Institute. Tom, in your presentation, you didn't have a lot to say about the domestic political situations in the Southern Caucasus, and yet, to return to your comparison to Estonia, I would say that in the political dimension, the South Caucasus perhaps comes off even worse than they do in the economic dimension. So I guess my question is, to what extent do you see the failures of democratization in the region and the failures to resolve the conflicts and the security issues as being interlinked and mutually reinforcing? Great question. Mm, very good question. Um, I, I think, but maybe I just have a very short answer. Yes, they are reinforcing. I, I think, I think um, this kind of uh, conflict definitely um, begat a very kind of authoritarian um, way of thinking um, in this region, which in turn gave birth to more to more conflict, um, and and the way that these countries are very closed off in many ways from the outside world. Um, closed borders and so on, I think reinforces. Um, but I see the political and economic very much linked to the fact that the, these, the, the vertical, the classic um, Soviet, post-Soviet vertical of power in these countries is both economic and political. It's about a political class who've also, in, in many ways, captured um, the economic resources and don't want to let it go and want to share it out only with, um, with their friends. Um, so I see these, these processes as, as, as being... Interlink. Georgia is, is probably the most promising of the three, um, but then Georgia has always had traditions of more of pluralism, as I, I would say, than democracy. Um, Georgia does have a natural uh, pluralism to it. Um, um, Armenia, again, um, would be um, slightly worse, and Azerbaijan uh, worse again, I would say. So um, 
this, this is this is very worrying. Um, and but again, I think and there's there's things we can we can try and do about trying to change the political system. But I, I think that's pretty hard, which isn't to say we shouldn't try. But I, I do think, again, taking my approach, which is looking at the regional aspect and the economic aspect, I think it is is more doable if we're looking at, at, at some kind of long-term transformation. All right, I promise this gentleman here in front. Hi, uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. Uh, having had the good fortune to read an advanced copy of the book, not only do I recommend that it be widely read, but actually even widely assigned. I think the book should be assigned in block in places like American War Colleges, other training institutions, the UN, OSCE, um, corporations, practically anybody doing, having, <laughs> involved in And he's in an caucus. unpaid advocate. <laughs> yes. uh, I mean, it, partly because it fills a yawning gap that I'm not aware of any other text in yeah. English that even remotely uh, compares. Adnaka. One shortcoming I would identify for a Washington readership is partly one of the virtues of the book is that it treats Russia not as an outlier to the Caucasus, but as an integral part of it geographically, demographically, historically, not, and so forth. Not, the, not, not the South, the, what you call the South Caucasus, but the, the Caucasus as a region. Right. Unfortunately, it doesn't do the same for Turkey and Iran. Hmm. And those are countries which demographically, geographically, historically, are integral to the Caucasus. And increasingly, Turkey is going to be playing a real political role. And Iran plays a quiet but very important economic role. And in Washington, people's minds are bordered by the southern frontier of the former Soviet Union. Everything south of that is a gray area on official maps. And I've been in many an official meeting in which people express genuine surprise and even an irritation that Turkey or Iran even expressed a view on an issue involving the Caucasus, as if they were the distant outsiders rather than we. And my suggestion for your next edition of the book, since it's going to be in long-term print, uh, is that you expand your conceptual framework a little bit to treat the Turks and the Iranians as every bit as much important long-term permanent great power participants in these issues as is Russia. Um, thank you, Wayne. Um, and thank you for the, uh, um, I, I hope you've, you've sold a few dozen copies with that. Are you opening remarks? Um, Turkey is there and Iran are very much there in my first chapter um, in the, the sort of pre-1800 history of the Caucasus, and then they start to disappear. And they have, obviously, the last 20 years, they've started to come back. But I, I, I don't believe they're there yet. Um, I, and I've been spending some time in Turkey this year, and I see that great ignorance about the Caucasus um, in, in, in Turkey. Um, I actually have a little box in this book, also called Ajara, the, the conflict that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Um, in 1918 to 21, there were several conflicts in the region, one of which was in Ajara on the Black Sea coast. Um, and yet, it, this conflict didn't resume. And asking myself why, um, the Abkhaz and the Ossetians uh, and the Karabakh Armenians had their patrons, people they could, um, when they went to war, people who were behind them, the Russians and, and, the, Ar and the Armenians of Armenia. The Ajarans' traditional patrons were the Turks. And yet, suddenly, um, 70 years on, um, Turkey had pretty much forgotten about the South Caucasus. The Ajarans, the, the Cold War frontier, had worked in a way. And the Ajarans suddenly weren't looking to Turkey to um, protect them in a new conflict to separate from, from, from Georgia. All of which leads me to the conclusion that um, maybe in 10 years' time, if I do any audition, there'll be more to say about Turkey and Iran. But at the moment, they're, they're pretty much the dogs that are not barking. They, they kind of express an interest for historical reasons, but they're, they're economically, but as political players, they're not really there yet. Interesting. More questions? Uh, I'm Veronique from Public International Law and Policy Group. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, ex excellent and precious uh, presentation. My question is, um, what do you think of a uh, Russian strategy um, uh, of declaring South uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia's independence just right after the uh, war uh, of 2008? Thank you very much. Um, I think it was a mistake. I'm, I speak as someone who 
um, has quite a lot of sympathy for ordinary Abkhaz and South Ossetians and, and, and the state they find themselves in. And, and I think they've been unjustly neglected as people with, with rights and aspirations. But, but I, I do think it's a mistake, it was a mistake to declare them independent. Um, I, my Carnegie colleague, Dmitry Trenin, who I think was due to arrive today, but probably hasn't made it quite yet. And I separately arrived at, at the same idea um, about the Andorra model for Abkhazia and, and South Ossetia. That Andorra, uh, as, as this distinguished audience of course knows, is, has two heads of state and has done since 1278. Um, the, it used to be the King of France and the Bishop of Catalonia, and now it's the President of France, and I think still the, the Bishop of Catalonia. Um, and and the, the point is, in Andorra, you don't have to choose. You're, you, 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 if you want to be French, you, want, you can be French. If you want to be Spanish, you can see, be Spanish. Um, I think some kind of model whereby Georgians are allowed to return, um, and, um, but the peoples of those places are allowed to express a dual allegiance, either to Russia um, or, to, or to Georgia, um, and possibly have some kind of nominal sovereignty of their own, is, is, pro is probably the best long-term solution uh, to those uh, problems. But I think Russia declaring them independent, I, I think, just um, made things more complicated and didn't actually make them more sovereign than they were before. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Emil Sanamian, the Armenian reporter. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the presentation. I uh, wanted to ask you uh, to draw maybe some parallels that might not be necessarily the uh, the region of your expertise or uh, something that you have studied, but probably you have looked at it, is the Balkans. Uh, coming back uh, to U.S. Uh, this summer, I was on a plane with a woman from Croatia, and uh, she explained um, her regional dynamic and how, you know, the Croatians dislike the Slovenians and hate the uh, uh, Serbs and, uh, you know, have all, the, all kinds of attitudes about different people. So if we look at the Balkans today, uh, it seems to me that that might be the uh, the picture of the Caucasus 10 years from now, maybe 15 years from now. Um, how do you compare those two regions? Is that the dynamic? Do you see that kind of a lag? Is it something we're going to see in the, in the Caucasus in 10, 15 years? And what's the best way to manage these real issues that unfortunately divide different groups in the Caucasus? Um, well, I, I think you've, you've kind of know by now that my some of my recommendations, which is to work on the regional level and work on the on, on people like small business, um, which is what why I drew drew the actually the parallel not not with the Balkans but with Turkey, um, where which used to be have an economy controlled by these large corporatist oligarchic structures, and then with the last ten years the AKP empowered all the small business class who suddenly have been incredibly dynamic. I think something like. 20% of the world's denim is made in Anatolia now, something extraordinary. Um, so um, that's certainly one aspect to look at. I think um, why the Balkans is more stable, I, I think, is clearly that the, the, Euro the European factor is there, that, that Europe uh, eventually, and, and much too late, um, decided that it, it couldn't afford not to stabilize the Balkans and invested the resources and put in the, the troops and the policemen there um, and you know you, you you put on the the balance the six OSC observers monitoring the Karabakh ceasefire line and the sort of forty thousand troops who were in Kosovo and you see um, the difference of priorities there and clearly I'm not asking for forty thousand troops in in Karabakh um, I don't think anyone would approve that but clearly there's got to be an increase in commitment um, from Europe um, if only out of a pure, narrow self-interest that they don't want to see new conflicts there. Um, so I think, um, but you know, we, we look out at Brussels and we see that it's still very much in an introspective mood. The Lisbon Treaty was supposed to get a, a new, a more dynamic Brussels. It hasn't done that so far. Um, uh, my hope is that, the, 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 is that Europe is the sort of like, the, is the tortoise in, in, in this race, that the Russia and the U.S. of the hare, uh, and that Europe is the tortoise who will eventually catch up and, 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 and take over because clearly it, it is, I think, European Union has to be by example and by, um, and by investment has to be the, um, the player that we want to see more of, more of in this region. Great. 
Jessica. Oh, Jessica Matthews. I, I want to follow up on this question and, uh, because I, I've been puzzled listening to you whether, the, whether I'm, I need to think of this as another Balkans in terms of the, uh, of the tendency towards fractionalization and conflict or whether the default position here, as you described it, is if you take away the outside powers, in fact, everybody gets along f fine. Is it like the Balkans, or are you saying it's exactly the opposite? That, that um, well, I, I thought I heard both. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't know the Balkans but well, but I, I believe probably that, that uh, ancient hatreds are a bit of a myth in the Balkans as well. I mean, that Sarajevo was was a model of, of good coexistence as well in, in the Balkans, and it was the breakdown of the Yugoslav security structure. I can see Dick Miles at the back there who knows both. Maybe he can give us a better, I'm sure he could give a better answer than me uh, uh, on, on this. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, definitely not advocating a kind of uh, withdrawal, um, and I think some security architecture needs, is definitely needed for, for the Caucasus, I suppose and what I'm talking about is a kind of reconceptualization, um, a, a, a deal with Russia where Russia is, is, is kind of certain factored, certain Russian interests are factored in to the Caucasus, but not, um, not the Russian uh, military interest in, in the Caucasus. So um, I'm talking, uh, I, I suppose the difficult thing Again, about the Caucasus is 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 how it's it's a kind of lands in between. It, it's um, it's it's not one thing or, or not the other. The Balkans is identified and identifiably Europe, so it's pretty obvious what the security arrangement is going to be there. What we can see now is that the security arrangement in the Caucasus um, has gone wrong, um, and I don't think the conversations we're having at the moment are fixing it. So it's about trying to get a new conversation involving the Russians and the Turks and the Iranians. Um, 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 there, but not imposing an agreement, but, but working with the locals um, to look at that, look at an arrangement that doesn't doesn't just satisfy one group, but satisfies all groups. Um, and this is the sort of the puzzle um, that we need to be need to be fixing. Okay. Here in the front. Hi, I'm uh, Josh Kuchera, freelance journalist. Um, I, I, I want to follow up with what you said about Turkey and what, what role do you think Turkey's going to play? Obviously, their foreign policy is kind of in flux these days, and they're trying a rapprochement with Armenia, and um, but yet have these traditional ties to Azerbaijan. And as you said, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan appear to be heading towards another conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh. And I'm curious what, what role you think Turkey's going to play uh, in that, if, if the people that you talk to in Turkey kind of had an opinion about what they're going to do. Well, I think I, I think Turkey um, mishandled, unfortunately, the opening it had with Armenia. Um, maybe it's not just Turkey's fault, but it, but it's largely Turkey's fault. Um, um, if Turkey wants to be a regional player in the Caucasus, it has to deal with all three countries, not just um, with two. Um, and that means dealing with Armenia. That means opening borders, um, normalizing relations. Um, they for whatever reason, they didn't manage to complete the normalization with Armenia. They allowed Azerbaijan to torpedo it. Um, and now we're really stuck. And in fact, what the Turks have managed to do with spectacular incompetence, you might say, or bad timing, perhaps, it, it would be a kind of way of saying, it, um, is they've tied one difficult process, Armenia-Turkey, to an even more difficult process, Armenia-Azerbaijan. Uh, um, so I think... Um, Turkey needs to kind of regroup and and uh, and work out what to do next. Uh, um, I don't think um, it's in its long-term interest to be shut out of the Caucasus and have no relations with Armenia. Um, so it's all about what can be given to Azerbaijan to bring it into this process. Um, um, and I, I think, again, if we're asking about Washington, um, Washington's role could have been to make a stronger case to Azerbaijan that Armenia-Turkey normalization was in Azerbaijan's interest, that is, it would actually wouldn't do them any harm, would actually do them quite a lot of good in the long term. And I think um, looking back on this process, if let's say if Hillary Clinton had, had visited the Caucasus not in July but in January and stood up in Baku and said, 
this is a historic process which we support between Armenia and Turkey, and we think it's good for you, Azerbaijan. Um, that would have been, may not have been decisive, but that could have at least been a push towards Azerbaijan um, not to try and torpedo the process as, uh, as it did. But now, as it is, we're all, we're, we're all stuck, unfortunately. This is actually a good example of the uh, terminal bilateralism that you're talking about, mm. whereas the U.S. was very focused on the prospects of a deal between uh, Turkey and Armenia at long last and uh, didn't seem to factor in Azerbaijan until this fatal linkage had already been, been made. That's a good example. I know we had some questions in the back there. Uh, Steve and then the man next to me. Hi, Tom. Uh, Steve Levine. I'm a contributing editor of Foreign Policy. Great talk, thanks. Tom, looking back, if you can, 15 years or so, um, you're suggesting that if this great game ha hadn't played out on the Caucasus, that we'd be looking at a different place right now. So I, uh, I wondered if, if you could sketch out what would we be looking at now if the US hadn't gotten behind the BTC pipeline would Shevardnadze and Aliyev have been able to carve out the independence that they did? Yeah, I, I hope I, um, I wasn't heard to be saying that, that, that the, the US shouldn't have got behind the BTC pipeline, um, which I think is, is, is a good project. Um, I think, as you, Steve, know better than I, the BTC pipeline had two incarnations. The first was very much a political project um, imposed and coming very much from, from Washington. Um, and funnily enough, the oil <laughs> companies didn't buy into it. The second project was much more commercial. Um, BP said, yes, this makes economic sense and invested in it. Uh, I suppose what I'm saying is, is the, the, the kind of, some of the talk that went, that went behind the first um, BTC euphoria was very damaging. Um, um, it, it kind of, it magnifies the, the expectations of the locals, it antagonized the Russians, and it didn't bind the, the oil, oil companies. Um, BTC you know, finally got going, and it's, good, it's, it's actually a very good project. Um, as I say, it shouldn't be seen as, as a panacea, because um, as, as, as again, you know better than I, the oil and gas doesn't uh, cure an economy, it just, it just um, doesn't provide a whole economy, it just provides a big, source of revenue, but, it, but it's been a good project for the region and I, I wouldn't want to be heard to be arguing against it. Um, I just think, again, if we look at these, this concept of two rushes, that, 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 that this great game talk really was speaking to the, to the Russian bear rather than the Russian businessman, and, and, and we should have been talking to the Russian businessman, um, and maybe the Russian businessman is now emerging anyway, but, but um, the conversation went very bad at one point. Yes. Okay, Andrea Lario. Um, I have one comment and one question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one comment concerning uh, uh, your idea shared with Dmitry Trenin about the Andorra solution. Um, it seems to me that essentially uh, the same proposal has already been made two years ago by Mikhail Saakashvili in the summer of year 2008 to Russia. Uh, and it has been uh, very clearly uh, some kind of uh, clarified, but it has been rejected. Actually, it has not been even discussed. Uh, that time, Russian leadership wanted very clearly not a shared responsibility of South Ossetia, but independence of South Ossetia, actually, the occupation of South Ossetia. It was before the war. Um, so it just looks like, with all due respect to you and to Dmitry, uh, seems to me uh, this idea is not in interest of the Russian leadership even two years ago, and it just I wonder whether it would be uh, it would be interested today uh, with absolute new geopolitical situation. Uh, but my question would be on different subject. Uh, you already mentioned uh, Nagorno Karabakh, um, and the, the risk of new war probably the highest at the moment. Um, uh, just if you can try to some kind of play this game, uh, if all of a sudden the new war will be sparked over there regardless who will start first. Uh, but uh, what would be the behavior of main players, not only inside the South Caucasus, but outside, including Russia, Turkey, 
Iran, United States. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, on, on the proposals in 2008, um, I think the problem with the, my problem with the Saakashvili government was not that they ha didn't have some good proposals and some good people, including um, Iraqli Alassania, for example, although he was then moved to New York. Um, but the, it, it sort of spoke that it had, again, multiple actors. For every Alassania, there was a hawk who was talking about um, reconquest. Um, and although they came up with some good ideas, they also came up with some rather threatening attitudes, which um, precluded the Abkhaz and Ossetians from engaging. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. R Russia, when we look at the map now, I, I, I may look rather strange when I'm talking about a long-term deal over Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but as I mentioned, um, Putin at the Baldai Club was apparently um, beginning to talk about this. He was actually, he was actually talking about that, that, they, that Abkhazia and South Ossetia will have some kind of relationship with Georgia in the future. Um, and I think this may be a case of careful, for, uh, be careful what you wish for, that, um, that Russia um, you know, wanted Abkhazia and South Ossetia to be separate from Georgia and has now inherited um, them as, his own, as, as its own and is, is experiencing problems there. Um, um, and um, so I think we'll see is the answer. This, isn't, this is not going to be a short-term process. This is, we're talking 10 15, 20 years before this plays itself out. But I think we'll see, and, and we'll see if my prediction is right, that actually a compromise will be done in that time period over, over these two territories. Um, on Karabakh, I think it's a very good question. Um, I think Russia in particular um, is now heavily invested in both Azerbaijan and Armenia, so, and, and has recently signed a new defense pact with Armenia. So it's a nightmare scenario for Russia for there to be a new war over Karabakh, which would basically oblige Russia to defend Armenia and therefore lose Azerbaijan. Um, Turkey, likewise, I think, would, would be, feel obliged to back uh, Azerbaijan, which would not be something it, it would feel very comfortable um, about getting involved in a war in, in the Caucasus. And particularly, um, Turkey also has, dating back to the Treaty of Kars, has, has obligations to Nahichevan. So, uh, yeah, we're looking at some pretty bad scenarios once fighting starts. Um, so hopefully that would be a signal for a lot of people to try and stop it pretty quickly. But um, as we saw in South Ossetia, a lot of damage can be done very quickly. I think we have time for just about one more question. Uh, so we'll uh, get one more person. Or she's already gone, so can you? I'm uh, Vlad Gorshkov from the PBN company. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there should be an emphasis on the development of small business uh, in the region. Uh, but uh, small business does not happen independent of strong institutions that support the economy. And, uh, and these, these are weak in the region. Helping to uh, build them presumes, at least in my opinion, uh, seeing the region as strategically important, uh, at least for the sake of securing resources uh, within Washington. So, Given this constraint, can you elaborate on how you, how you see mm. the U.S. Uh, helping to do that? Well, let me say, I, I suppose, um, when I say, I, obviously I'm being slightly teasing when I'm talking about strategic insignificance, um, but I would like maybe this region to be more strategically significant for USAID and, and less for the Pentagon, shall we say. Um, and, um, and um, you know, it's a small region, so, you know, money does, does go along... Uh, Longer than it, than it would in in other places, um, and sure you need institutions, but you also, um, as I was mentioning, there's, there's there is there are activities which are happening spontaneously, which could be supported. There are there's, there's trade going on, um, often great very ingenious trade between Armenia and Turkey, for example, via Georgia. No one um, sat down and wrote a business plan for it or or a proposal for it. It actually just happened spontaneously, the Armenians and Turks found each other and managed to trade via Georgia. So um, if you know, customs rates could be brought down, if those borders could become more transparent, um, that would, at a stroke, you know, empower those people. They would become richer. More of them would come home from, from, from Russia. So th these are the sort of small incremental steps I'm talking about, which I'm sure foreign donors can, can do a lot to, to promote. 
Well, great. I think uh, this is a good note to end on. I should note there are books outside, uh, and I know Tom will be happy to sign them and uh, take more questions. Thank you for the great questions today. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.